so let's get kind of the heart of, of the issue tonight that I'll deal with and, and uh, kind of the focus of this topic is, is dystocia. Dystocia is basically by definition is, is difficult birth, okay? All animal species that I've been around deal with this. We, we run into this uh, in my family's cattle operation. Uh, we run into this at the swine barn. We actually run into it quite a bit at the swine barn now with the new lines of genetics. And it's, a, it's an issue that uh, we work very hard with our students on so they learn about it and understand it so we can minimize it because we want to do the best job we can to get live lambs on the ground and to increase our weaning percentage. What are some possible uh, causes of dystocia? Why would we have difficult births? You'd have them from aborting. If the ewe is not ready physiologically and she's aborting a month early, you could have an issue there because her cervix might not be dilated. Uh, number two could be a possibility if you're in certain breeds where your uh, breed emphasis on, is on big framed or fast growing or very muscular animals. A lot of some of the sire breeds out there might throw big high birth weight lambs. One of the things we do at the University of Minnesota is we tend not to use sires that have large birth weights themselves. Unfortunately, um, maybe uh, it's hard to get genetic values on sheep regarding uh, our sheep sires regarding uh, birth weight EPDs or birth weight values. So we have to use actual data, um, but we don't use sires that uh, they themselves were born too large. So we try to minimize birth weight size in the lambs. Abnormal presentation, we'll talk about that quite a bit. Failure of the cervix to dilate. Vaginal prolapse could, uh, it could give you an issue with dystocia. A deformed lamb, um, uh, we see that every once in a while, but not, it's kind of rare. I did see a photo the other day, a friend of mine uh, on Facebook put a photo of a two-headed lamb up and said they had a two-headed lamb and, and uh, with all well, those kind of things, you could run into a difficult birth. Use too fat, use too skinny. Both of those things could cause difficult births. Um, I think one of the myths out there that some people believe is that you could uh, kind of starve your use towards the end uh, to minimize birth weight. And yes, that will, if you do starve your ewes and, 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 and feed them uh, not enough towards the end, you could have lower birth weights in your lambs, but unfortunately you could also have ewes that are kind of skinny and have more difficult births because they're just their uh, energy re reserves to, to have lambs, to give births. There's been some really good research in the cattle industry that that, uh, that technique of starving the cow to minimize birth weight is actually causes more birthing issues. And so in the sheep world too, we see that. An ideal body condition would be what you're shooting for. And then multiple births. We see a lot of dystocia issues in our triplets. For some reason, they tend to get tangled up quite a bit, uh, not as much in our twins and, and not nearly hardly in the singles, okay? But if this is the case, the U, if any of these things happen, uh, the U might need to uh, require assistance with lambing. So some abnormal presentations, and, and we'll talk more here about that now. Uh, some things we'll see, I'll show you some illustrations. Uh, you may see any of these abnormal presentations if you lamb enough use. Out of our 40 ewes that we lamb every year, uh, I would say about 10 of those ewes get assisted by the students. And so about a quarter of them, okay? And you could see these different abnormal presentations uh, uh, at any time, both forelimbs back, the head back, which would be deviation of the head, a breech position, we do get these students always uh, tell me that they, uh, I'll see them in class uh, after they did their lambing watch and they'll say they had to assist a breech position and a posterior position, okay? So here's some good illustrations that you've all probably seen, but uh, this kind of shows you the, the different abnormal presentations. And there are others that I'm, uh, I did not put up on the slide presentation, but there's some of that where all these things are happening and the lamb is even upside down at the same time. So they can come in all different uh, shapes and directions, but both legs back, one leg back, which is very, very common and one that you normally can assist very easily, head back, breech position and hind legs only. So we'll talk about these, okay? Just want to put a slide up here about uh, some tools or some help that, that is sold out there that will help you. And I would suggest that uh, a lambing cord or a lamb puller be part of your lamb. Uh, lambing kit. Uh, both of these work very, very well. 
you can purchase these from most farm stores. This is a lamb cord with a, a plastic handle and a, a plastic type pull string that you can pull tighter around the animal. Or if you just get some rope, you can actually make these by yourself. We have these at the barn, but our students over time, they tend to like just a rope apparatus with a, a kind of a tightening cinch on the end with a stop knot, which keeps that rope from getting too tight. And so we prefer a lambing rope, but there are many producers that get along extremely well with the lambing cords uh, and snares extremely well. And so you'll need to use these at times uh, to go around the legs of the lamb or at times to go around the head of the lamb or the kid uh, in order to keep it in a proper position as you're trying to direct that lamb out in a normal uh, lambing position. So the rope can either be put around the back of the skull and underneath the jaw with your, uh, with your knot here underneath the chin, or some people even apply it around the back of the head and in through the mouth of the lamb. Um, never tie it directly around the lower jaw by itself because you can run the risk of, of injuring that animal. So let's talk about pulling a lamb. And this is the same lecture I share with my students. And so um, it's kind of uh, a way I can introduce them to lambing before they get turned loose on uh, lambing watch. So the first thing that I, I tell the, the students after they've recognized that a ewe's in distress and she's uh, been pushing for an hour and there's no, uh, nothing's happening. There's not, she's not making any traction. Um, and so I'll tell the students, okay, then we need to identify that this ewe's got a problem. Where do we go from here? The first thing we do is we isolate the ewe, okay? And so we run her into a smaller, a walker into a smaller area in the drop pin that we can section off a corner, okay? And then from there, we need to make sure that that area is clean and, and, and it's got nice clean straw bedding in our case. And then we will probably try to restrain the U. Our U's are, are, uh, get worked a lot by students in a lot of classes, so they're somewhat tamer than a lot of sheep. And so the students will usually put a halter on them or some sort of uh, collar, but normally it's a halter so we can restrain them. Sometimes when you're pulling a lamb, um, that you might want to be, you may pull the lamb while she's standing up or you might pull the lamb as she's laying down, but we always tend to put a halter on her so we can tie her to a fence line to work with that you, okay? And then I also tell the students to make sure that you're, you're, you're clean, your arms are clean, wash your hands, wash your uh, hands and arms and elbows. And I tell the girl students in the class, the young ladies to take off any rings any jewelry that they may have on their hands. Uh, if they have to go inside that you, we don't want to uh, hurt the you that way. And I actually make the students in the class cut their fingernails as well. These are little things you might not think about, uh, but again, if they're going to go on that you, uh, you know, we want to make sure they're not going to hurt that you in any way. Well, so they uh, prepare for that. And then what we'll do next is we take the U's and we tend to once we got them restrained, we like to wash up the ewes. Our ewes get shorn before lambing, which is a nice thing as far as keeping that ewe clean. Um, and then we clean the backside of that ewe. We clean around her vaginal opening. Um, we use just a basic Novelson solution wash, uh, but any kind of disinfectant would certainly work if it's approved for animals. And then we, oh, we, we sleeve up, okay? Um, it's kind of a rule in our barn, and maybe it's because we're at the University of Minnesota, uh, we have to kind of make sure all the students follow a safety protocol, a biosecurity protocol, a PPE kind of protocol. So we, we sleeve up. And so we buy basically OB sleeves that you'd use for breeding cows. And we buy latex uh, hand gloves as well. I like to personally put the OB sleeve, OB sleeve on and then I put the latex glove over the top of my hands. Uh, and most of the students kind of follow that lead because it gives them a little more feel than a slippery uh, OB glove that maybe oftentimes don't fit your fingers very well. That's kind of loose. Um, I actually pull the fingers off the OB sleeve and then put the glove over the top so I have extreme uh, kind of grip and feel. It's very important, uh, again, for the females in the class, especially, uh, particularly uh, those that are wanting to be pregnant or are pregnant if I have a, a student in the class, because many uh, of the diseases that could, could uh, uh, be found in the placenta could be transferred to, to, to young ladies. So be extremely cautious in handling placental material 
um, and uh, placenta and afterbirth on the ground, be very, very cautious there, particularly uh, if you're a young lady, because there are some diseases that can be transferred to humans. So then uh, in the kind of the process of assisting, if that U has been struggling, we need to do some exploratory work. So we've uh, sleeved up, we've gloved up, we've cleaned the U, we've applied plenty of lubrication to our hands and we'll palpate the U and kind of feel where we're at. If the cervix is dilated, then fine, then we can kind of move forward uh, and maybe assisting and finding out why that U, the lamb's not progressing. But sometimes the cervix isn't entirely dilated. Um, if it's partially dilated and the cervix is a hard muscular opening uh, to the uterine horns. And so you can kind of go in with your fingers and you could feel that hard muscular opening. And if you can get your finger, you know, go in and maybe get a one finger in or two finger in, you can kind of slowly dilate the cervix. If over time, it may take 10, 20 minutes, but you can kind of expand your hand to a point. Eventually, you can get your fist through there. Now, the, the water bag coming through the cervix and the lamb pushing through the cervix sometimes will help dilate it as well. Now, I say that with a caveat. If you go into the U and explore inside the U to see what's happening and you feel that cervix completely blocked, completely closed, you may, run, you may actually experience a condition called ring womb. And with that situation, then I think uh, I would probably look more towards calling a veterinarian for assistance because uh, sometimes the cervix will never dilate if they have a ring womb condition and you might have to end up doing a C-section. We don't see that at all. Uh, I should knock on wood, but I have not seen that issue here in our flock uh, as long as I've been here for 15 years. We've had partially uh, dilated cervixes, uh, but never a totally closed cervix. So um, determine the lamb's position. We try to feel for the hand, lamb's uh, head or his feet. And uh, the best thing I could say is to be efficient at Correcting a misrepresentation or mispresentation is the best, to be best at that is have an image in your mind of what the proper position should look like. Because if you can understand where the, the, the head should be and where the leg should be, um, then to correct the problem, you can visualize it much better. So the correct position of a lamb is called a diving position. That's when the front feet come out first and the nose is head uh, kind of lays right in between the front feet. So that's called the diving position. This is both feet forward with the muzzle in between as if the lamb is diving. And this is the proper position. And if, I, if the students uh, do an exploratory palpation and they, they go in there and they feel that that lamb is in a diving position, then I generally will tell them, okay, sit back and wait a little bit and let the mother uh, push and see if she can progress. Because then I know it's not a mispresentation, then it's probably just a size issue. And then if the mother has strong contractions and a strong will to push, she, she oftentimes can get that lamb out. If not, then the, the lamb will be assisted. But uh, first and foremost, we wanna know if that lamb's in the correct position. Some of the miss or male presentations that you could see then, if you go in and do some exploratory uh, palpation and you realize that the lamb's not in a, in a correct position, these are some that you may see. And this is a, some of the more popular ones we see at our barn. Uh, head back. This is when the head, uh, as you can see in the illustration, has fallen back. The two front legs are, are there where you can feel them, but when you reach further in, you feel no muzzle. You feel no forehead on the lamb. And so first thing you got to do is try to get the head up in between the front legs. This takes a little bit of time. Sometimes that head gets a little slippery and wants to kind of almost sling back on you quite a bit. And so we tell the students generally to push back on the chest a little bit because sometimes that U is strained so hard, she's jammed it already up in between her, her pelvic rim. And so we try to, try to push that lamb back a little bit by the chest floor. Hopefully the students have then the ability to get their hand down besides, beside, the heads, uh, beside the head of the lamb, grab the muzzle and pull it forward. There are times where we have to use the snare or the rope that we, that we use to go around the head to keep it in that forward position as we're pulling. And so this one takes a little bit of time. You need to be kind of somewhat gentle. You don't want to tear or damage the U. Uh, the head gets a little slippery and wants to go back generally sometimes. But once you get the head in a proper position, then you can start moving everything forward through, through gentle traction. 
the breach position. This is kind of a scary one for students. Um, they'll be watching lambing watch and they'll see a U straining, a U straining. And then all of a sudden the first thing they see is a tail. And that gets to be a little bit scary. One thing you'll notice in this breech position, if you are watching for a water bag, uh, oftentimes this position somehow they'll break the water bag and you won't get to see an external indicator of a water bag. And with this, it, if the water bag breaks and you didn't see it and you don't really, uh, you're looking for a water bag, you may uh, run into a deal where you've waited too long and that could be a very dry uh, birth canal because the water bag is, is broke a long time before. So you need to be a little bit concerned if you don't see a water bag, but that ewe's been straining for a long time. This is when the lamb is basically butt first and you're seeing the tail first. So what we do, and, and I think what, how to handle this is, first of all, you need to make a little bit of room because we do want the hind legs to come out. And so we tend to push the buttocks forward to try to clear enough space for our hands to go down on the bottom side of our pelvic rim. And one thing I would advise is to, if you can, to, if, to cup the foot of that baby lamb inside your palm, if it's possible, if you can get your arm uh, far enough down. Sometimes you need to just grab them by the hock because it's so hard to get your hand all the way down there, push them forward, but you have to grab the hock to get a little bit of leverage to get that leg up. But I would advise to put your hand or put the foot of the hand inside your palm if you can, because those dew claws, which lay on the backside of their, of their pasture area can be very damaging to her uterine tract, could, could rip her up pretty severely because they're very sharp. And so we don't wanna have a lot of, of problems there. So um, if you can get your hand around the foot and then from there you pull up and out and you wanna try to get the back feet uh, pointing straight out. With the back feet pointing straight out, then I would advise to pull as quickly as you can and work with her contractions to get that lamb out. Because one of the things you could do is you could rip the umbilical cord because you're pulling in a backwards manner. So once you pull the, rip the umbilical cord, that lamb now has to start to breathe and live. And, and he's sitting there with his head in a pool of water, essentially. And so he's gonna ingest a lot of uh, mucus and, and fluid into his lungs. And so you don't want him to drown and you wanna get him out as quick as you can. And, uh, and so in this technique, it's possible you can do it, um, but you gotta get that lamb out as, as quickly as you can, efficiently as you can, once you get the hind legs up. One leg back uh, is a very, very common delivery issue at our barn, um, or even two legs back. And we handle it in a couple different ways. If the lamb is somewhat large, we tend to try to get, get the other leg forward so we have two legs forward. There are lambs that are coming this way that are very small, that we almost can just grab the rear side, uh, kind of their neck right up by their shoulder and just pull them out with their legs back because they're small enough and there's enough room to get those lambs pulled out with their two legs back. Um, but if they're too big or the lamb has a lot of size to it and we're worried about that, pulling too much on the neck and shoulders and that lamb's not going anywhere, then we have to rearrange that off leg and, and grab it by the, the, the knee and pull that leg up into the birth canal. And then once it's got uh, both legs up in the diving position, then we could give some traction and help the you. It's a relatively uh, easy one to deal with. Here are some other ones, and, and um, I won't break these down, but uh, you can find all different, uh, all different uh, male presentations out there. These are the four front legs. This one kind of is a little bit uh, unsettling to the students. One of the things I always tell them, when you do your exploratory palpation and you determine that you need to pull a lamb, that it's time to pull a lamb, make sure that you're pulling the same lamb. Because sometimes you can pull a front leg from lamb A and a front leg from lamb B, and then you run into a, a roadblock. So feel the leg, follow back to the shoulder, follow it to the head and come back to the other front leg and make sure you're pulling the same lamb. Otherwise you could run into a lot of a lambing distress if you're pulling on the other lambs. The front and the back lamb, uh, what we'll do there is try to get the first lamb out front ways in the diving position. And instead of trying to rotate the second lamb, if his hind legs are coming first, we'll go ahead and pull him as well from that position. But you can run into all these uh, problems as well with the lambs upside down. And that's a very, very challenging 
uh, situation because then you need to try to go in and, and actually tilt that lamb or turn that lamb so his backbone's up and his belly's down ideally. But I've seen, we've had lambs coming upside down and backwards and that gets a little more challenging. So things to remember when pulling lambs and we're about to finish here, uh, a few more slides. Um, try to coincide your pulling, your assisting and your, your thrust, uh, hopefully with the contraction of the mother, okay? Sometimes that's difficult. Sometimes uh, even my students feel a little bit of pressure and they want to, uh, to make sure that lamb gets out before anything happens. But if you can co coincide with the pushing, that's wonderful. Never apply traction to a lamb or kid without correcting the problem. And so if you have a hip lock or if you have shoulders back that's not allowing you to get that lamb out, applying traction uh, to one of the limbs might cause damage. And so don't apply traction unless you've corrected the problem first because I think you could run into even more problems. Never pull them by their jaw or by their bottom jaw uh, because that could result in a, in a broken jaw. And these are things that we've experienced, unfortunately. If the lamb is too large or the kid is too large, you could also run into an issue that you see in the beef industry quite a bit called hip lock. And one of the little tricks to solve the hip lock issue is if that lamb is, is very large and he's got a big wide hip in him like some of these show lambs do, um, just turn the lamb, rotate him and pull, rotate him and pull. Because what you're doing then is getting his hip structure at its widest point with the pelvic rim, pelvic region of the U at its widest point, the vertical point. And so it allows that lamb and it's a pretty slick little trick and, and then just pull and turn at the same time. And that'll allow that lamb to hopefully pass the birth canal a little bit easier. And also just some pointers and things uh, to remember when pulling lambs, chains and traps should be positioned above the pasture. Um, if you position them below the, uh, the dew claws and on the, on the, in the, uh, right in the center of the pasture, you could run the risk of damaging the foot or, or injuring it quite severely. Um, if you're using chains, uh, it's normally advised to do a half hitch. So you go around the, 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 uh, around the uh, foreleg of the animal and do a half hitch. This is an illustration of a rope. Uh, but if you do a chain, it's better to do a half hitch because those chains can be kind of damaging. They're very strong and sharp. Um, I think this is kind of interesting. We started to do this technique a few years ago that if we're going to use the rope and those feet aren't out of the U, but they're kind of back inside the birth canal, we try to wrap the rope on the underside. So when you're pulling, you don't get kind of a roadblock with those pasturings turning over um, in, in claws and causing a stoppage as, as the front, front legs are coming up uh, out of the birth canal. And then when we place traction on a U uh, to pull the lambs, we tend to walk the lambs through the birth canal. Uh, one kind of pull on each shoulder, each leg one at a time to walk those shoulders through the birth canal uh, instead of trying to pull traction on both shoulders at one time where we can get into a shoulder blockage or just a complete uh, standstill. So, um, and it's kind of recommended that if the ewes are lying on a side to do the lower limb first, how that pelvic region is laying there on the ground and how it's, it's showing itself for the widest spot, uh, do the lower limb first, but if they're standing, which tends to be at our barn. It seems like a lot of the, uh, the kids tell me they tend to pull the lambs for some reason while the ewes are standing. Um, it's okay to pull any of the limbs first, the right or the left. Um, and while they're standing, we tend to pull straight out at the beginning. And then we pull after we get them out halfway, we'll pull down and go with the flow of the ewe. So when to seek expert help. Um, and there are times even at our barn, even though the students are doing this and I want them to experience slamming and I want them to, to learn techniques, there are even times where we can't do it. And so when to seek expert help, um, if no progress is made within 30 minutes of the students uh, working hard to reposition the lamb, to get the lamb in the correct position, uh, then they'll call me, uh, they'll call our dairy barn manager who has great experience with birthing animals or even uh, then call a veterinarian to, for that final assistance. After a few attempts, um, if they can't determine a presentation or position, uh, then they call for expert help and they'll call either myself again or, or someone that can come help them uh, with figuring out the presentation of that lamb. So yes, it's okay to seek help. It's okay to ask for 
uh, an expert in the area of other sheep producer or if you work with a good sheep vet, uh, it's definitely okay to get them to assist you. Uh, the worst thing we'll do is just to kind of uh, not do something uh, because again, our number one goal here uh, with our, our sheep herd is to get live lambs on the ground. So after that lamb is delivered, I'll finish up and I know Whitney's got some great information on lamb care. Um, and Whitney is our vet, and so it's really good that uh, she, she works with us uh, really well um, here at school. After the lamb is delivered, hopefully we get that lamb uh, pulled, we get them on the ground. Hopefully after that lamb is delivered, it, it's breathing, it shows some activeness, it wants to shake its head, it wants to move its body. Uh, we want to get that lamb breathing on its own, okay? So we'll generally, like most of you do, probably wipe the placenta off its mouth. We have rags and, and, and towels that will vigorously kind of rub that lamb to kind of get the blood flowing to get its heart and lungs moving and get it going. We'll clean the mouth out and get it going. Sometimes these lambs after a hard pull do struggle. Okay, they're weak, they're a little worn out, they're tired, they're shell shocked themselves. And so we work with the, we work hard to get those lambs through rubbing and, 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 and massaging to get those lambs stimulated to breathe. Uh, we use uh, the old trick we tickle the nose. That's kind of one of our big go-to tricks with the piece of straw to get that lamb to sneeze and clean out, uh, you know, its airways and get that lamb going. Once we get that lamb to give a good sneeze and kind of shake its head from the tickling of the nose, we feel pretty confident we have that lamb. We don't swing lambs. We don't hang lambs. Um, there's so much good, good information out there from some really good cattle vets uh, that says actually this is probably not a good technique. Because uh, really all the fluid, if you swing a lamb or hang a lamb, basically the fluid that you're actually seeing is, is not from their lungs, it's from their GI tract. And, and, and up to not that long ago, we practiced that technique. And I know uh, there's people that still believe in it, and that's certainly fine. But we don't do that here. Uh, we've, we kind of do a new technique where we sit our, our lambs and our, our newborns on their chest with their lay, back legs forward, almost like in a, in a dog position. Um, and, and that allows them to breathe. And we have very good success getting those lambs going uh, in, that, in that fashion. So we love to have the ewe uh, to get up. We would love to have the ewe to come over and lick her baby and start that bonding. Some pulls get pretty hard and some pulls get to that ewe, uh, that ewe will be down for a little while because she's, she's tired She's been through a lot of stress and she doesn't feel like standing up right away. And we understand that. So we do, we do the best we can. We bring the lambs in front of that you and we try to even let them bond while she's laying down. And hopefully we haven't hurt her to the point where she can't get up, but it does take some use some time on a hard pull. Uh, if it's cold, obviously give the lambs some sort of heat source. We don't want hypothermia to set in. We're fortunate that our lambing barn, our drop pin, we can keep it at a nice temperature for lambing. Uh, but if you do lamb on a cold, uh, try to make sure that lamb comes in and gets warm. Uh, there's, a, there's certainly ways to warm up that lamb, and that's probably not the point of maybe what we're talking about tonight, but uh, wa warm water baths, warm blankets, uh, hair dryer. We use a, use a hair dryer in a box technique here to warm up our lambs. So a lot of good techniques to get that lamb's body temperature up. Make sure that lamb gets adequate colostrum. Uh, that could be a challenge with a hard pull, a lamb that's uh, suffered a lot of stress. It could be uh, a lamb that's just a little slow to get up. So if you have to, you may have to tube the lamb or, or give them some sort of artificial colostrum uh, as well. Uh, maybe the ewe doesn't want to get up and, 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 and be a good mother right away because she's sore and tired. So getting colostrum in that lamb as quickly as possible is vital to that lamb to survive. Um, Strip the, strip the udder, make sure that uh, you has a nice udder and, and teak quality for that lamb. And basically I tell the students this, if, it, if we can get that lamb to survive the first 24 to 48 hours of its life, it's a good chance that that lamb's gonna make it to adulthood. So that's our goal here. And, and uh, from there, hopefully we can uh, uh, do that and get those lambs weaned and get them off uh, into their adulthood. So with that uh, last slide here, and, and this could be really a good opening to kind of a, a discussion time. Um, why are we having too many lambing issues? And uh, we've been up and down here at the University of Minnesota, my experience here for 15 years. Uh, one of the poorer years we had for lambing, and we had a lot of born uh, lambs born dead, is because we used a sire uh, that just threw too big of lambs. 
and uh, my, I didn't do enough research into his pedigree and his history, uh, his bloodlines. And uh, the, we just got too many 16, 18 uh, monster lambs, 18 pound monster lambs out of him. So I learned a valuable lesson that year. Um, use too fat, poor mineral program, poor nutritional program. Use not big enough. And that opens up to another discussion about breeding ewe lambs versus breeding and, and saving those ewes to other yearlings. Uh, we don't breed our ewe lambs here at the University of Minnesota. We wait till they're yearlings. Uh, and one of the benefits of that, besides some other teaching benefits, uh, those ewes are bigger and they have a bigger body size. So kind of a rule of thumb, don't breed your ewes until they're about 70% of mature body weight uh, because you could run into birthing difficulties that way. So thank you very much. If you got any questions, uh, we'll go ahead, I guess, and, and visit about that. Travis, we'll take over as MC. Thanks, Kyle. You've provided so much uh, excitement that uh, people have been extremely stimulated on uh, providing questions. Um, we'll try to get uh, through at least a couple of them. What's uh, a thing that you could say in suggestion of, of either one that, that's had a lamb and knowing if there's uh, a, you know, a second one in there or if, the, uh, if we're at three? Um, and I guess I would have you describe that in two ways. One, they have a, uh, a lamb that's on the ground and you don't know. And then the other thing is, if you've pulled the first one, uh, do you just go back in there and, and check and see if there's a, another one coming? Yeah, uh, that's a good question. Generally, though, um, we, um, if they have the first one, uh, they'll have a water bag for the second one. There's always a water bag and a placenta for each lamb. Okay, so one of the things you can look for is another water bag. Okay, another, I guess the first thing you can uh, look for is how big was the first lamb? I tell my students if that first lamb was a big lamb, 15, 16 pounds, there's a good chance that that use probably done. If the first lamb was uh, an eight, nine, seven pounder in our herd, our, our, our flock, uh, then there's probably a good chance she's got more in her. But then uh, the second thing would be an additional water bag as she continues on in her birthing process to have another one. And then there are times where we do exploratory palpation. We just glove up, sleeve up, uh, into her birth canal and feel for another lamb. Particularly if she goes and lays down and starts straining again, that'd be a, a great sign as well. So all three of those things. And, it, it, and, and to be honest, to do an exploratory palpation, if it's done gently, if it's done with plenty of lubrication, uh, it's not gonna damage or hurt the you at all. And so don't be afraid. And, and I tell my sisters, don't be afraid. It's better to know than to sit and guess. And so if they need to enter that you to check it out, that's fine as well. But size of the first lamb is a really good indicator at our flock anyway, to give us kind of an idea what's going to happen next. Yeah. And do you have, uh, with that size, do you have any particular uh, insights? I know this one's a tricky one, Kyle, but uh, some say, hey, there's a big lamb, there's a small lamb. I just presume that, you know, those are how those developed. Uh, and you said that um, previously that the, the lamb size was too large on that sire that you so chose. Some of that's gestational length as well. Uh, just your thoughts in terms of, of just lamb size at parturition. Um, well, uh, that, you know, that's kind of an uh, interesting question. We, we monitor that very close here at, uh, at our, our flock. We take birth weight records on, on every lamb that's born at our flock. And, um, we, we can correlate that the birthing difficulties and uh, it's just pretty straightforward. Lambs that get to be in the, in our flock, 15 or greater would probably be considered upper birth weight size here in our flock. And we see a higher incidences of dystocia in those bigger, larger lambs. As, so we monitor that and when we decide to keep replacement bucks, grow out our own bucks to use within our flock. Um, it is a, it's a calling criteria. It is a castration criteria. Uh, we do not keep any buck lamb to use within our flock that was born over 12 pounds. This is the only information we have in the sheep world. The cattle world uh, has birth weight EPDs and, and breeding values that give you much more uh, accurate genetic worth of an animal. Uh, so we, that's kind of what we have in our situation to use, and it's our best knowledge that we have. Um, and so from there, we did run into kind of a train wreck uh, uh, one of the first years I was back here. 
and uh, we we lost quite a few lambs just to do to such large lambs and such hard pulls and with that uh stillborns and born and died may you know died right away during that birthing process um is that is that what you needed to know travis I forgot. Great, Kyle. i'm gonna i'm gonna ask one quick one um um just on the nutrition of of those ewes or, and do you it do you guys uh or ultrasound those ewes uh to determine number of pregnancy and if we can just take that quick um yeah. and if there's anything on just uh, the nutrition and then we're gonna roll to uh to dr Kanauer. yeah that's a great question and that could be a whole nother discussion um and that's a great question because uh ultrasounding those ewes and knowing the number of lambs that they most likely will have uh is a wonderful management tool and i would we do that um if we can ultrasound those ewes in a stage of their gestation where we can see the, the fetal development accurately, we will get those numbers. And we have often done that, and we like to do that. Um, Whitney does our ultrasound work for us. And, and with her help, we know obviously the ewes that are bred, but we can also know the fetal count, which allows us to prepare because we'll have it in our records that the students can look at during the observation of a lambing watch and say, well, She's, she was told, you know, we, she's on the list to have two. Let's be watching for two. Um, nutritional wise, we, uh, we monitor body condition score very, very closely here. We take body condition scores on our use four times a year. And uh, we want our use to come into lambing at about a three to a three and a half body condition score on a one to five scale. So that puts them in the middle, not extremely uh, high condition, where we can run into big oversized lambs um, are, and not too skinny, these ewes where we can run into birthing difficulties as well because the ewes not strong enough, not enough energy reserves. So a three, and a three to three and a half is our ideal body condition score coming into lambing season. Thank you, Kyle. And um, thank you for that transition. Um, uh, great information there, particularly on uh, our different birthing processes and how to help us with uh, challenges on dystocia. Uh, we aim to get through several of those questions. I know that there's more in there. I'd like to thank my colleagues again for responding to some of those questions and also to our attendees for sharing the knowledge that you have uh, with the rest of our individuals that are interested on sheep and goats. With that, we're gonna move on.